he, uh, well, he mowed along a little bit for me, but hey, I'm from the, Opvel, uh, the original Opvel, uh, it started all in Utrecht in the, in the Netherlands. Um, but this talk has nothing to do with what I do in a day to day uh, job, unfortunately, because of machine learning and well, uh, I work at the National Grid in the Netherlands. Uh, they do stuff with machine learning, but I'm not part of, uh, of those teams. So uh, this has everything to do with my son having too much Lego. Uh, he's now nine. Uh, it's actually his birthday today, so uh, I'm missing that one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, but he has a, a very big box, uh, something like this, uh, filled with Lego sets that he originally built uh, and deconstructed, of course, uh, and he added up in the, in the box. But he really likes to build stuff from the instruction manual. Well, the instruction manual is fun, but if it's all scattered in a box, it's not really fun to get all the stuff uh, back uh, uh, once again. So I can do that manually. Could probably take me a weekend or so to do the initial sorting and then maybe another weekend to, to find the, uh, the right stuff. Uh, but that is an iterative process and if you, yeah, uh, that's something you probably need to do once in a while. So it's repeatable as well. So if something is repeatable, try to automate it. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, this actually started around three years ago. So I'll see where I am now and still not automated anything. So a uh, good way to uh, have an excuse to not sort by hand, but automate it. And take three years, probably going to take four or five years, I don't know. I don't know. we'll see uh, at the end where I'm at. Um, so three years ago, uh, I wanted to start this project and I was at a, uh, a T-junction in the road. I had to do something with machine learning because well, that's the only feasible way to do uh, or to, to sort Legos because it needs to identify the Lego bricks. Um, but you could take the paved road and the, and the Python way. Or you can take the, the left road, which is Java, and what's well, on the fire and on the construction, and but well, so crappy. But on the right side there's a snake, so I don't like snakes. So <laughs> I, I, I took the left side. So when I started with machine learning, I was bombarded with a lot of terminology, like a loss function, gradient descent, activation, a bias, labels, epochs, I got no stuff. I'm not a machine learning expert, and I'm still not a machine learning expert, but I will try to take you along on the journey that I've taken, uh, and I'll teach you about the most important bits to get, to get it to work, and to, to make it do stuff you want it to do. So if you want to do machine learning uh, in, in Python, there are a lot of libraries out there. There are uh, something like uh, Keras, PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow, uh, Panda, all kinds of stuff. You pick one and uh, you can do stuff with it, you can find all kinds of different uh, examples online. You can do it anything. But in Java, what's there? Uh, I've taken the frameworks that have been updated in the last year and are free to use uh, in training and actual uh, the uses of it. That left me with Deep Learning for j uh, That's actually the thing that I was started with uh, three years ago when I googled uh, machine learning with Java. This one always popped up. Uh, there's Elki, a uh, quite recent uh, framework, uh, but that was not for me because that is really a die-hard uh, mathematical exercise uh, to prove models. Well, I don't want to prove models, I want to use models. Uh, this one's not for me. Uh, then I came across to the uh, DJL uh, library, or the Deep Java library, and it actually is an abstraction above uh, a number of frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch. And those two are really interesting because those are the most used uh, frameworks. There. But like I said, I started with uh, Deep Learning for J. Um, but DGL came across maybe in a year and a half ago or something like that. So I wanted to see what, what was the difference. So I did some benchmarking um, on the blue side is the DGL, uh, the Deep Learning for J, sorry, uh, and the green one is the DGL library. <coughs> I tried to do some benchmarking on a uh, Azure uh, machine with uh, a GPU in it. Uh, actually, the uh, Deep, Deep Learning for Java didn't even finish uh, well, the, the first uh, model, uh, and it actually took around, well, uh, maybe 10 times longer than the other uh, framework. So it was time to change frameworks. 
So that was really a, a painful exercise. So lesson here is if you want to do something and if it takes a long time, because training a model takes a really, really long time, uh, see if something else is out there and do some benchmarking yourself. Uh, but what about Python then? Because, well, if you want to do machine learning, you need to do Python. Python must be great and fast, right? So there's actually some benchmarks with that as well. Uh, as you can see on the left side is a older version of TensorFlow. It's not really apples and apples, but, well, uh, I did test with PyTorch, the Python version, and the Java version. And actually the Java version is a little bit faster. Not by that much. Yeah, a second, a second counts. You take one, uh, you one. Uh, and there is another framework, the MXNet. Uh, it's a default uh, well, implementation for DGL, uh, which I used uh, uh, in the first year or so. Uh, and then later on moved to PyTorch <coughs> because that was uh, better supported and well, was actually uh, supported because it was not in the, in the first year. So what about using the model then? Because the previous benchmarks for, were for training uh, and actually, if you want to yeah, identify a single brick, for example, with, uh, with, a, with a frame, Java is, again, a little bit faster, not by much, but every bit counts. And especially, I want to, uh, to run this on a Raspberry Pi or another ARM processor. Uh, these numbers are on my MacBook, so on the Pi they are quite high, um, actually around two seconds per frame. So yeah, it's going to take some finagling later on. Uh, but what gives? Why is Python so fast then? Well, if, you s if somebody says, I'm doing machine learning in Python, what they're actually saying is, I'm doing machine learning in C++ and using a Python API to call that C++ engine. So it's only a little mm -hmm. layer that is actually Python and really gets offloaded really fast to C++. So there's only a little bit of overhead in Python. That's why there are so little difference between Java and Python, because they're essentially using the same engine. Because that engine is in C++, and for the DGL library, there are multiple engines, all written in C++, uh, which have the same API. So it's really useful if you want to swap out uh, the engine underneath. If, for example, one gets a huge upgrade in, in efficiency or something, you can use a different engine without changing your code at all. So that's really nice. So let's do something with machine learning then. I think everybody knows this meme, right? This is how to confuse machine learning with dogs and muffins. This has nothing to do with Lego, but is really a prime example of how machine learning works and how to train it. It's, it's quite easy example. It only has two things, so that's easy. Uh, well, of course, you can ask ChatGPT it, and it will give you a correct answer. However, if you change some of the images, it will still give this answer, because it is pre-trained to give this answer and this answer only. So ChatGPT can't actually solve this meme. So, that's fine. Uh, but anyway, let's do some exercise first. Let's confuse some humans. <coughs> I want you to raise your hand if it's a dog in the center of the image or in the center of the screen or a fist if you think it's a muffin. It will appear quite quickly, so what was that? I see a lot of hands, I see only hands, so that's good because it was this little guy. So if we want to speed it up a little bit, that's a muffin, that's good. That was this muffin, that's the same muffin, come on. <laughs> what was that? Still a little doggy, this doggy. What was that? Was it a mob or was it a dog? <laughs> Still hands up for the dog and a fist for the mob. What, if, you, if you think it's a muffin, what should you do? <laughs> if you think it's a muffin, uh, <laughs> uh, I see a lot of mobs. But it was this little doggy. <laughs> so what you actually learned is if you were expecting something, you would actually do really great at identifying what, what is on screen. <coughs> and the same thing holds true for machine learning as well, because if you train a model and train it on dogs and muffins, it will actually be very good at that, but it won't identify this dog. So it is really specific to what you trained it, and it will only do that specific thing, nothing else. So let's do this with machine learning then. 
Well, the first thing that I did was split up the uh, dogs and muffin into two categories. Uh, the muffin and the chinchilla, and uh, let's swap those. Uh, <laughs> because it's really important to have the same things in the category. If you have only one bogus thing in there, the machine learning model will train on that bogus thing and it will screw up your entire results. So be very aware of what is in your data set. So check it and check it again, because otherwise you get fun results. So this is my validation set. I will test the machine learning model that I've created until this set. I can't really use this set to train the model on, because if I use this set, there are only 16 images, so it's quite a small set anyway. Uh, the machine learning model will know exactly what is going on because it already seen every image. So that's not, not good. So I want to have more images and I want to have original images. So uh, the devil on my shoulder still uses Python if I want to do uh, two line stuff. <laughs> uh, I wanted to download 2000 uh, dog images and 2000 muffin images uh, from the internet. Uh, and you can actually do that with Python uh, in four lines. So that's quite cool. Uh, so I did that, uh, and I had a data set, right? The only thing is there is something odd here. There are duplicates in here. Because, well, if you search Google, you get a lot of duplicate results. Uh, people copy a lot on the internet, uh, but they also reuse, resize, uh, maybe crop out a bit. Uh, there are a lot of duplicates in my set. So I needed to remove all the duplicates because, well, duplicates in machine learning is not really good. Uh, because it gets over, overly trained on that specific image and it will only see that image. Yeah, quite a question. I had the training data two images with uh, plural dogs and plural muffins. So if one dog has regularly two eyes and you have uh, plural images with four, six, eight, or ten eyes, doesn't the uh, algorithm then get really confused? Uh, I will repeat the question for the, uh, uh, for the listeners at home. Uh, does the model get confused if you have a dog with uh, multiple eyes? The dog has usually two eyes, uh, and if you have suddenly a dog with multiple eyes, uh, it's odd to have a dog with multiple eyes, but the model could actually see those two oh, eyes and two things. Yeah, well, a picture with four dogs. Uh, the machine learning model could get confused if you train it only on single images. So if you train it on a single muffin or a single dog, uh, then the machine learning model could be well, triggered on those two eyes to be identifiers for a dog. Um, and then if you, if you give it four, four dogs, for example, then it will say it's a muffin because it has more than two eyes. That is a risk, of course, yes. So if you want to identify multiple dogs or single dogs, you have to include them both in your uh, data set. So I want to remove uh, all the duplicate images here. And as you can see, there are also uh, images with multiple muffins and all kinds of stuff. Um, so what you can do is create an image hash. An image hash is like a, a fell hash, like a checksum. The only thing is that it doesn't give anything about uh, the size of the image. Uh, and you can actually calculate the distance between two images. So you can see if they are exactly the same or roughly the same. And there is a percentage that you can get out of it. So that's really nice uh, if you want to compare images. Uh, and of course you can do it with Python again. Uh, I won't bore you with, uh, with actual Python code because it's a little bit more than two lines. Uh, but it was the original data set, uh, and I ran it uh, uh, well, well, over this, uh, this data set. It cleaned up nicely. I had around 2,000 images downloaded, and I got 86 left. <laughs> <laughs> so, <coughs> downloading 2,000 images from Google is not really a good idea. What is a good idea then? Well, there is a nice site uh, on the internet called Flickr, and it got a lot of images, and they are all <coughs> nicely categorized as well. Luckily, there is a Python API for that as well. So, what I did here is download the 250 top uh, muffin images from Flickr, and again, the dark ones as well. Uh, put them in the data set, also reduce the duplicates in there, and well, Flickr doesn't really have that many duplicates, so that was really nice. But I still got 250 images that I downloaded from Flickr and some 40-ish what I got from, from uh, Google. That is still not quite enough if you want to train a machine learning model. 
you want to have at least a thousand images or something like that in a single category. So what can you do then? Well, you can actually do something like data augmenting. You can take one image, resize it a bit, rotate it a bit, um, and for us, those six images look roughly the same as the original image. But for the machine learning model, this is completely different. They couldn't be any more different than, let's say, a chinchilla that is this color and a black chinchilla. It really doesn't know. So this is actually a good way to multiply our data set. So I had around 250 images. Uh, with this uh, method, I came up with 1,700 images per category. So that's quite nice. Uh, and of course, you can do this in Python again. Uh, you can actually do this now in, in Java. It takes a little bit more code, but uh, there is a image gen uh, or yeah, image data generator class in, in uh, the Keras uh, library, which can actually do this. So you can give it some parameters uh, how to change the, the, the original image. It's uh, quite useful too. So now it's time to build this in Java then. Well, start up by uh, IntelliJ, new uh, Maven project. Does everybody here works with Maven? Or somebody doesn't? Gradle? Sh should be the same, right? <laughs> uh, I'm using uh, uh, Maven here. Uh, what I'm actually going to do is import a uh, bill of material. That is a, a file that contains all the dependency information that you want to have for a specific uh, thing. So the deep journey for J uh, has a uh, bill of material that I can import. And then I want to do something with a data set. I want to do something with a model. And a model comes from a model zoo. I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, and in this case, I want to use the MXNet model zoo uh, because the models are specifically built for a specific engine. Um, so uh, this is what I started with. So let's do something uh, else. Uh, let's first upload that. Let let us load the uh, data set that we want uh, to use. A model actually doesn't really work with random images. It really likes to have a fixed input size. So the first thing I needed to do was um, well, load the data set, set the repository path to a directory, and then resize the images to 224 by 224. It's a really common input size for uh, for the models that we're going to use. Uh, and images are in um, RGB values, so there are values between 1 and uh, 255. Uh, but integers are not really well with machine learning models, they really like floating numbers, uh, floating point numbers. So we need to convert that to a number between 0 and 1, uh, and that's the uh, to, to, te uh, to tensor. That actually converts it to a floating point number that the machine learning model can, uh, can actually work with. And then I do need to do something with batch sizing. So let's zoom into the uh, batch sizes. The batches are the number of images that you are going to give the model at once. So if you have a data set of, let's say, a thousand images, you want to chunk that up in little pieces because you can give the, the model multiple images at once. Uh, it will do that more efficiently if you do that one by one. So changing it to, uh, to batch sizes is quite uh, uh, good for performance. Um, but there is also a trade-off there. If you have batches that are too large, the machine learning model will see too many images at once and will then start to see the commonalities between images and will focus on that. Uh, yeah, so it becomes too specific to that image set. So if you give it smaller batches, it will actually perform better or that's what the lecture says. There are a lot of lectures out there on the internet. Uh, I quoted here one. Um, so the trick here is to keep the batch sizes as, low, as small as possible to get the best results, but as big as possible to get the fastest results. So if you look at the performance, you see it actually well, dives in. If you, if you do one, that's the, the, the left, it is quite slow. If you give it two, it becomes twice as fast. Well, that's kind of logic. Four doesn't really become twice as fast, but it's, it's going down nicely. So a batch size of 16 was quite good for me, uh, and eight gave me actually the best results uh, for this uh, specific use case. So try around with that as well. So that's one of the things you can tweak around to see 
uh, if you can't get your model any better. So that was the batch size of eight, uh, and you want to randomize this uh, data set. So you don't want to feed it the exact same batches every time, you want to randomize every time uh, it's been, uh, been trainable. So if you run this, you get a nice process bar. Great. But we need to do something with the model. There are actually a lot of models already pre-trained for this specific use case, identifying things. Uh, this is a list of the Kiros website. Uh, it lists a lot of models in here. Uh, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Some are really fast, some are really accurate. Uh, but I found that the ResNet 50 model was A, available in the model zoo that I was using, and B, was quite good for the uh, performance that I was looking for. So I took that one. <coughs> so you can actually uh, load it up with a, uh, a, a model builder, as they call it. It's a model uh, ResNet V1 uh, with a builder, and we want to give it a shape. Well, we give it the same shape as the input images that we uh, just resized our data set to. Uh, and the three in the front is, of course, the red, green, and blue. So this will take all the color information it can. And then I say the number of layers is 50, because it's a ResNet 50 model. The number of layers are 50. There is also a ResNet 151 uh, model. Guess how many layers it that one got. And I want to say the output size is two, because it needs to identify two things. Well, you can actually load that model in a, a try with resources. Um, it's really important to close the model if you are uh, reusing the same code. So if you have a long running process, you might want to close the model because otherwise it will leak a lot of memory because it uses C++ native stuff underneath. Uh, you need to clean that up. And well, it's been done on the close. Uh, but then I can use a new trainer. Uh, and uh, do something with a soft loss entropy loss function. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, and I was to uh, set an evaluator. So it evaluates every iteration on how good the model is. And well, this case we want to focus on accuracy alone. alone. Um, and we want to set some logging. And that's about it. Then we get our trainer. Uh, a trainer does nothing uh, with it having set What's what it needs to, to train on. So we uh, initialize the trainer. Uh, we again give it the same shape again with the uh, red, green, and group. And then we give it two data sets, namely the data set that we have downloaded from the internet and the verification data set. So it also validates on how good the model is, and that is done in a separate step. And if we run this actually, then uh, well, with the power of editing, uh, this goes a lot faster. And we see two numbers on the bottom. I don't know if everybody can see that. But we see an accuracy of 73 and a soft max cross entropy loss of 79. <coughs> so let's zoom on to accuracy and entropy loss. Accuracy is a number of how many things it got correct. So just if it guesses 100%, or 100 things out of 100 things good, you get a accuracy of 100%. So it's a number between one of uh, zero and one, between, uh, well, zero is, is bullshit, and one is the absolute best. That's 100% accuracy, that's all the rest of it. But entropy loss is the reverse. It, if you get closer to zero, it actually gets better. So you wanna flip those numbers uh, around. Because the entropy loss is actually uh, the distance between the result it should have and the thing that it came up with. So if it came up with the correct thing and the correct accuracy for that thing, then it will become zero. So if it's 100% certain that it is a specific thing, then that will be a zero. But if it's only 1% sure, uh, it will give a loss function around 20 or something. It's really quite high. So you want to keep the loss function as low as possible while getting the accuracy as high as possible. But those two should well, converge on the same level. So that's something to keep in mind. Well, if we continue the training, we get a lot of outputs uh, out there. Uh, and in the end, we see that our test accuracy is uh, 81%. And that's the train accuracy, sorry. And that's the stuff it's trained on. But the validation accuracy is 56%. It's not really good, but well. It only took, it only trained for one iteration, so it went through the data set only once. It's quite fun. 
So if we run this again, we get different results. So there is something in machine learning that is randomness. There are a lot of random factors in machine learning. And it actually uses randomness to change parameters in the model to get better results. So it just uses a random seed. So you can actually set that specific random seed if you want to do some performance testing and benchmarking, if you want to see if some little changes have an effect on your end result. You need to set the uh, seed as well, because if you don't, well, those tweaks could be worsening your end result, but it just uses different randomness that end up with better results. So this is something you need to keep in mind if you want to train models and test those models. Well, we trained the model, but now we want to save that model as well. So there's actually uh, something quite sim simple. You can actually say, uh, I want to save that model to a directory, uh, and then you have your model. But that model does not contain the categories that you're trained it on. So if you load up a model and you don't have the categories that it was in there, you have a model that is completely useless but because you don't know what is outputting. You're only getting, it is, it is category one and I'm 80% short of it. But what is category one? So that is actually something that is uh, saved in labels. So what I did here is uh, save the labels into a uh, synset uh, text file with every label on a different line. Uh, it's a default way for this uh, uh, DGL to store those uh, uh, labels. So those two are stored separately. And we're done. We have now trained a model. And this is where most tutorials on the internet end. So that's quite annoying because I don't want to train the model, I also want to use that model. So, using that model is quite similar than training the model. Actually, we can copy-paste a lot of stuff. We actually should copy-paste a lot of stuff, because we are going to use the same model. Uh, we're going to use the same input parameters as well. So we want to do everything the same. So again, we want to do a ResNet1 with the same shape, number of inputs and output size. But now you might say, hey, but wait a minute, we just saved that model, why don't we load that model and that's about it. Well, actually, if you can see the file name in there, it's called parameters. So when we didn't save the entire model, we only saved the parameters for that specific model. So if you would load up those parameters in a different model, it would absolutely break because, well, it really doesn't fit. So those parameters are just how the model is actually constructed, or no, it's not constructed, but filled in. Uh, and the thing that we're building on uh, in below is actually the scaffolding which in the, the parameters are loaded. So we need to do the same thing. Uh, again, we want to try with resources for the model, and we want to, in this case, load the model. And then we want to do a uh, something with the images that we're going to uh, check out, and that is being done by, with a translator. And a translator is the same thing we've done with the data sets uh, when we loaded it, we resized it, uh, and we made it the tensor. So, again, the same thing, but just a little bit different. Uh, and with a translator, we can actually create a predictor on the R model. And we can actually say, okay, let's load an image uh, and use uh, OpenCV to get that image uh, loaded into a, a bitmap that uh, the, the framework can understand. And then we can say predict, and then we can get the top k out of uh, out of that. And if we run this, we'll see that it has, uh, uh, our prediction is a muffin with a pr probability of 74% uh, uh, and a dog with 25%. Uh, but that's quite good. It has three little eyes. So. <laughs> Could be. So to understand the model a little bit further, you wanted to create a confusion matrix. Uh, and confusion matrix is used a lot in machine learning. Um, and it is something you can uh, plot the actual into the what, it's, uh, what it should have been. Uh, and as you can see, the muffins, it got three little muffins wrong uh, that is identified as a dog, and one dog wrong that identified it as a muffin. So 
not too shabby for a single run machine learning model, right? But that makes things better. If we do the same iteration again and again, so uh, train the model for another iteration, go through the entire data set again, um, and do that a number of times, uh, let's say 20 times, you can actually see that around the fourth iteration, it got the best results, the best accuracy. So that's quite nice. But we don't know when to stop. It just keeps on training. Oh, that's a bit of a shame. Uh, there was actually something in Python uh, for this. Um, it's called a early stopping configuration. Uh, and I want to first start that out. Uh, there was an open feature request for early stopping configuration in DGL. Great. Luckily, there was code, uh, already pseudo code in that issue. Uh, and the first iteration quite, well, it worked. That was nice. Um, but then I had a big mouth on, on DevOx and I said, maybe I should open a pull request. Uh, and I did. Um, so it's now implemented in DGL uh, 1 point, uh, uh, or 0 0.25. So if you're late on the net, you can actually use this API uh, that I'm going to show you now. That's the early stopping configuration. Um, uh, let's see how this goes again. Uh, again, we want to say that the training stuff goes, uh, goes the same thing. We have our evaluator, but we want to have a training listener. Uh, in this case, we want to save the model on every epoch. An epoch is uh, just a full uh, iteration of the data set. Because if we train the model again, the model might become worse than the last time it was. So we actually want to save every iteration or every epoch of the model. So we can actually use the best, e uh, use the best model uh, at the end. So that's what the uh, safe model uh, training listener does. It just saves ev on every epoch. And then we have our early stopping uh, listener. And you can say, OK, I want to do at least two uh, epochs. Uh, and I want to stop if the percentage of uh, improvement it comes below one. So uh, that's quite high because, well, especially if you have a limited set of, of things. Uh, maybe you want to set it to 25% or something like that, just, well, or 10%. And you want to say or, uh, stop if the, the training has run for at least 90 minutes or something like that. Uh, and do at least three epochs uh, at minimum. Uh, and when you set this, it will actually output uh, a lot of uh, parameter files on the, in, the, in our model. And we can actually use the model that has the best result. So you have to dig through the uh, logs and see which one uh, has the best results. But hey, uh, you can actually use it. Uh, and it will actually stop. In, in this case, it fails to achieve 1% improvement over two times in a row. And then we'll stop. And then well, you might want to go back one or two epochs to see which one was the best. So then we can tune something with learning rates. Learning rate in machine learning is a little bit like this, this game where you have to hit the space bar on the exact moment that it's on the green, right? Probably played all those, those games uh, back in the, in the time. Um, machine learning is a little bit like that. It does a lot of, lot of things and then you save it and then it's well, in the state. Problem is, machine learning only sees the end result. So it doesn't see how green it's fr in front of it or how green it is next to it or if there is even a bigger green spot a little bit over there. So it goes into red a little bit and then it goes into the green. It really doesn't know. But we want to approximate uh, and get to the green stuff uh, the fastest. So what you can actually do is step through the, the things uh, a lot faster because if you change a little bit and then do a full iteration, that, that's gonna take a, a big time. What you probably wanna take big steps uh, in, the, in the first uh, few iterations and then slow the learning rate down a little bit after it gets to the greener stuff. So there are actually some uh, learning rate optimizers. Uh, in this case, it's, uh, it's square root. So uh, it will start to uh, learn less fast the, the further it comes uh, along in your uh, training model. Uh, and there's also something to keep in mind if you want to do early stopping. Uh, because if you use square root, uh, after 20 or so at epochs, the machine learning model will not train at all. It will just not improve because it's stuck. It's just 
changing so little at a time is, is not worth it. But square root is not really a good idea. Uh, there are actually some mathem mathematicians that have really gone bizarre on this, um, machine learning experts, and they come up with a lot of optimizers. And those optimizers, for example, are Adam. And Adam is really the most used and popular used um, out there. Uh, and when I use that, it will actually improve my uh, end results quite a bit. So if I take the same confusion matrix, only stopping at the best uh, model and using a atom optimizer to get to that specific point as fast as possible, I got only one mismatch. So for a exercise on how machine learning works, this is good enough for me. So you might have learned some heard something about uh, transfer learning. Transfer learning is when you take a model that's already trained on a specific data set and uh, well on the top is the input and at the, at the bottom is the output. So you're actually gonna lock a few layers into place and only change the last two layers that actually end up in the, in the results. The last two layers are actually only used for categorizing stuff. You can imagine that the first layer is changing um, uh, the image so that the culture, uh, co uh, contours are very really visible and that kind of stuff, and removing noise and that, that kind of stuff. It's all in the first, first layers, and those are all the same for everything. So, uh, But when I use this, this method, uh, I only came to 50%, so that's really crappy for my use case. But hey. if you want to do it, you need to do some uh, more uh, hardcore uh, machine learning uh, Java coding. Um, first of all, you can download a pre-trained model with a little bit like Hibernate, like query syntax. Um, you can say, I want to uh, search for image classification and it should have an input uh, as an image and classification as output. Uh, and it must be a ResNet model uh, with 50 layers and flavor V1 or something like that. And then you have your model, a pre-trained model not only the parameters, but the entire model. Uh, and then you can actually use that model and split it up and do all kinds of weird stuff with it. If you want to look into it, uh, fine, but no, it's not for now. But then again, Python and, and Java can also work together because they are using both the same engine underneath. So what we can actually do is train a model in TensorFlow uh, and then load it up into, into Java. So in this case, I have uh, pre-trained a model with, uh, with some flowers. What I need to do to convert it to a open uh, model, uh, that's something the DGL framework can actually use, is just load the model and save it as a uh, saved model. That's about it. And then we have a open uh, standard that we can actually use. So if we want to use that in DGL, we're actually going to need to add a dependency because we're now using the TensorFlow engine and we have to specify that we want to use the TensorFlow engine and then we can use the same criteria API that we've seen before but in this case we're going to point it to a specific directory on our machine and then we say just load model and then the other stuff is again the same as we used before the only difference is that this model was trained on a 150 by 150 input size so we need to set that to the specific thing and if you run this, uh, you can actually see that it's uh, predicted a daisy, and that was actually the, the good thing. So it actually yeah, uses the TensorFlow model without a training. So if you have a data analyst that likes to use Python to create all kinds of fancy models, let ha let's have him at it, export it, and use it in your Java application so you don't have to build a Python application with a REST endpoint to call that specific model and do all kinds of mumbo jumbo with it. So this is uh, quite nice. But then again, Lego, that's what we're here for. Well, this is a blueprint of uh, a Lego sorter that I'm building. Uh, it's a transport belt uh, which has a camera on top. Uh, and at the end of the, the transfer belt, there are three buckets. Um, the bucket straight ahead is for I didn't see anything or this brick is not the brick that I want. And I can have two buckets. Uh, I can sort, of course, two different sets at once. Or I can say one bucket is 
for the I am 100% sure this is the correct brick and this is maybe this brick that you want and I'm not quite sure so I can do some sensitive stuff with it but I haven't actually built it yet uh, I am in process of 3d printing it so uh, I've done some mock-up so in the left side on the top you can see a view of what the camera sees so there's a Lego brick on the uh, transport belt and that's being processed uh, well, and deposit into a, a bucket. So how are we going to do this with Legos then? Well, the first thing I thought was I need a lot of Lego bricks and a lot of images of Lego bricks. There is not really a good Lego data set out there. So I wanted to generate um, the images. And that's quite, uh, uh, that, that can be done. There is a database rebrickable. Uh, that has a list of all the, the Lego bricks and all the sets and which sets are using which bricks. That's quite good. Um, and there is a cat model of every Lego brick and there is a viewer for that specific cat model. So that's good. It's a Windows application. Luckily it works also on Mac and, and Linux now. Um, and what it can do is import that cat model, give it a texture and well, export it to uh, a different format. In this case, to Poveray. Poveray is a command line tool to create images uh, with ray tracing. So that's quite nice. Uh, it's all based on text format, and it can read those uh, those cat uh, uh, things, uh, and it can actually output uh, decent enough uh, bricks. As you can see, that that one's generated. So if you want to do this, uh, there are some flashing images on the next slides. So please bear in mind if you can't handle that. Uh, these are the images that I've created. So I've created a lot of bricks. They're all kind of different orientation, different colors and all kind of fancy stuff. Uh, then I need to find the sp uh, specific bricks. So I want to do some uh, analysis on where things are. Um, give it a square because well, our model needs a square uh, and then uh, crop it out and then I get uh, these kinds of, uh, of images. So these are my uh, generated images, uh, in this case for this brick. Uh, but then I had a dilemma because I was trying something with with the camera angles and, uh, and things. There were uh, I could of course crop out a specific brick and give it uh, as less border as possible, or I can give it the exact dimension of what's on the uh, on the transport belt. <coughs> so it could actually use, to my opinion, the size of the brick. Who thinks that was a good idea to give it the actual size? One? One and one? Hmm. You would say so, but well, actually, the zoomed in model, or the, the cropped one, uh, came to an accuracy of 80%, uh, and the other was 65%. So, giving it more information, to my opinion, wasn't really good for that machine learning model, because that machine learning model is used to identify things. Uh, and that thing doesn't matter how far it is from the camera. This, in this case, it was actually helpful, but the model didn't know about that. So it wasn't built for that. So in this case, cropping that image, and it was easier to generate th those images as well, because well, you can uh, play around with it a little bit more easier. So what I need to do then, I could take my previous example, change the number of uh, outputs from two to 100, for example, and let's go. Um, 100 took around 9 hours to train with 25 epochs. So, and that was on a GPU instance on AWS. Uh, quite nice build from that as well. <laughs> um, but if we plot that on uh, a, a, a graph, uh, and in this case it was uh, in total 75 epochs, but it was with 10 bricks. So a little bit less data set because, well, 9 hours for 10. Yeah. But in the end, our validation set that was also based on those generated images uh, came to around 86%. That's quite nice. And it's stabilized around that, so I thought that was good. So I played around with some actual bricks with another camera, uh, only three bricks that I have laid around. It came to around 35%, 33%. Hmm, that's odd. There are also three bricks. So, Confusion Matrix comes to the rescue here again. Um, I plotted it, 
and as you can see, it only identified A301 of 3001. So if you say it always that specific thing, you get it right in uh, one third of, of the times. So, uh, so if we run a little bit further in the epochs, uh, around epoch uh, 47, it started to move predictions to other bricks as well, uh, but never the 3004. So, yeah, it was a little bit like, uh, uh, well, like, like dropping your Millennium Falcon, it's your baby project that's coming to an end here. So, a little bit of panic set in. So, what was going on here? Well, as you can see, you can probably guess which images are the generated ones and which are the actual images. And that's it's the same thing for the machine learning model. Those things at the bottom doesn't really look anything like the things that it was trained upon. So it's just like giving it the mop instead of the muffin, for example. And as you can see, the, uh, the generated images are a little bit more blurry and they have jagged edges on them and well, the real life don't have any jagged edges and that kind of stuff. So um, I want to improve on this as well. So what I did I was I created a validation data set of uh, five images uh, and, rec and actually ran it against that. And it came to 20%. So that's good because my new validation set was as bad as it was with the three. Uh, and then I started improving a little bit. Um, well, the first thing that came up to in my mind, I saw jagged edges because it was cropped. Uh, so the resolution was not really that good from those generated images. So I increased the resolution a lot. And well, it, it shot up to 25%. So making progress here. Uh, and then I thought, well, color information is something I can get from OpenCV, for example. It's really easy to get color information out of that. But <coughs> the machine learning model, well, it doesn't care about color that much. Uh, all the bricks have the same color schemes around them. There are some bricks that have specific colors, but there aren't many of them. So uh, I thought maybe let's give it some grayscale images instead. Well, if you want to give it grayscale images, you have to change two things. Uh, that three that we saw before for red, green, and blue becomes a one for grayscale. Uh, and we need to set a flag to uh, grayscale when loading in the data set. Otherwise, it will load up grayscale images and convert it into red, green, and blue for you. So, you need to set that flag. It's really annoying. Not documented. But hey. um, and actually, the performance increased a little bit because it doesn't really need to handle three color information, so that the input was a lot less. It isn't that dramatic of an improvement as I had hoped. Um, but I think in the first few layers, the information gets condensed into uh, a grayscale image anyway. So uh, you probably save a little bit in the first layers and then it's all the same. So when I did that, I got up to 28%. So getting somewhere. Uh, and then at DevOps, uh, someone came to me and said, well, maybe you want to lower the contrast a little bit. Then you remove the shadows of the actual images. Uh, well, couldn't hurt to try. So I got up to 31%, and that was with the lower contrast on the validation set alone. Uh, when I lowered the contrast on the training data set as well, uh, it improved uh, well, percent. It's not that much, but I, we're getting there. And then I thought, well, maybe I wanted to spice up the training set uh, some more uh, and do some horizontal and vertical flipping in the uh, in the data set. So. Let me get to the uh, to the data loader again. So in this case, we uh, loaded our data set. That's our uh, images. But we have uh, some transformations that have been done every time. So you could see that those transformations as a pipeline. And there's actually a pipeline syntax for that as well. Uh, if you don't use the pipeline syntax, it creates a pipeline for you. So you're always using a pipeline. But every time a image is is retrieved from the data set, it goes through that pipeline. So it always gets resized to, 200 and, uh, to 224 by 224, uh, but you can do other things as well here. So for example, like random flip to left and right. So there you can create a new image for that machine learning model by just flipping that image. You can flip it left to right, and you can flip it up and down. It 
it shouldn't really matter for that uh, for that brick. It's the same same brick. It doesn't matter which orientation it is. And so you can get a lot more uh, out of your uh, data set as well. And as this is run every single time a image is loaded from your data set, it really helps if your data set is already resized to the correct size. It A, saves a lot of space because those images are a lot smaller. Uh, so if you want to transfer that the training set to a machine learning uh, server somewhere, that's cheaper. Uh, and you don't need to do that resizing step because they are already resized. So that's also something to keep in mind. Uh, it's not that much faster, but uh, everything counts. Um, so with that, I came to 33%. Uh, and then I wanted to do some training with actual data. So I wanted to reduce my data set a lot. Uh, it was around 2,000 images at this time. So I reduced it to 750 images. So with 750 images, it dropped to 32%. Logical, because well, there's less to train on. So uh, it should go down. But then the best thing ever happens. Uh, I used actual images in that training set. Now my accuracy shot up to 97%. So, now we're getting somewhere. And if we run this uh, with the previous example with the uh, mock-up uh, blueprint, um, we can actually see that image is uh, being classified and being classified uh, with high accuracy. And if we remove all the uh, things that are not correct and create a confusion matrix, uh, you see that the things that it didn't guess correctly, it also had a lower accuracy. So that's quite good information. So if I discard all the things that are below, let's say, 90% certain, certainty, I have a 100% correct data set, or at least for my uh, view in there. So we're getting there. So the takeaways from all this are uh, creating data sets is really the hard part of machine learning. This took me around 98% of the time I've been working on this. Uh, the Java API is really not that hard. Uh, you need to set up a machine in Azure to do the training. That is hard as well, uh, getting the stuff there. Um, but Java can be used for machine learning. So that's good. Java is also a little bit faster than Python. So if you want to do, uh, well, do some good for the environment, uh, this is also a good excuse, be greener. Uh, but then again, Python has a way larger ecosystem. Uh, there are more people skilled with Python and machine learning. So if you wanted to create a model, you probably <coughs> can find a Python engineer, uh, but not the Java engineer that can create a model. But hey, as we have, cons as we have, cons as we saw, uh, Python models can actually be used in, uh, in Java. That's quite nice. So any questions left? These are the repositories anyway. Uh, I know there's a typo in the repository, but it is the actual repository with that typo. Uh, it's on way too many slides to fix now, so. <laughs> uh, but you can uh, find the repository here. Any questions? I incorporated a lot of questions that I had had before in the presentation, so <laughs> I can imagine that. <laughs> I'll be here uh, a little bit longer, so if you've got any questions, uh, come and see me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. um, you left out all the part of like, how you eventually um, like managed to put the video into um, maybe images that you use with the uh, train set. Is that hard? Was it a hard part? Or um, In this case, I created a mock-up of the uh, actual thing, uh, uh, let's say. So I, I had some uh, A4 paper and the camera on top. Uh, I use the actual camera that that's going to be used in the uh, eventual model thing, uh, and I just use manual labor to get it passing the the camera, and just using those images. Uh, well, I use FFmpeg to split that that movie into separate images and well, run it through. Uh, that is going to be the hardest part of this exercise. You can use the generated images as a uh, addition to your real images uh, and you can also train and get a quite low accuracy on image on bricks that you don't have but I would suggest getting as many as possible of the real images 
uh, and add additional generated images. Uh, if you train only on the uh, uh, real images, the accuracy goes down uh, again. So having a combination of real images and uh, generated images really helps. But that is going to be the hardest part and that's why I've not gone through this because I need to build the entire setup with automation that it's going to actually feed in bricks and give me nice videos of bricks passing by and well, that is something I need to build. It, all in due time. Yes? Any right. further questions? Like uh, Jan said, he will be here, so... Uh, yep. And uh, well, you got, you got uh, his, uh, his contact info, so you can bother him uh, afterwards, tomorrow, or the yeah, day uh, after. I see a question over there. Oh. Oh. The presentation was about how uh, Java can be utilized with the middle of image and uh, uh, overlap of the images. Is it uh, the same? Uh, the Java can also be used for natural language uh, data sets and uh, speech. Yep, uh, there are actually other frameworks. Uh, you don't want to see the deep learning for J because that is more of the machine learning model. And what you're actually referring to are the large language models. Uh, and there are a lot of frameworks out there uh, nowadays that actually uh, use Java, uh, like Lang4j, for example, that can actually use large language models in Java. Um, and well, that, but it's a diff different topic. <laughs> you have machine learning model and large language models. So there are two different things. Uh, yeah, Python still is in interpret language, so every time uh, something run, uh, the code is being interpreted. And in Java, it's compiled to, uh, to, to bytecode at first and then to machine code. And then machine code is actually, uh, well, that, that step is being done once. And for Python, it needs to do that every single time it comes to a loop uh, until it's offloaded to C++. Um, but that's just a little bit slower. Uh, and as you can see, it's not that's much slower. It's a little bit slower, but... Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, in the underlying tensor flows, then always uh, just the C++ has spawning in. So, that's why it's not the, that big of a difference. Yeah, the, the underlying engine is the same. So, you can only gain so little much of the, the things that are actually done in Python. And they really, really are good in optimizing so that it's using the least amount of Python uh, that they can. So, <laughs> hats off to them. Ready? Okay. Now, Jarl, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you.